Thank you, Tony. Um, I actually also found that a very provocative question, uh, the one, first one that I think David asked. Um, I think that uh, certainly the relationships, I think we would agree in many cases, would change. You know, you would see maybe even a direct line to the uh, societal capacities to innovate and express ideas. And there might be even some subdomains, as Tony said, that would probably be different. But anyway, I'm not going to be talking about the map in this context. You might be glad to know. Um, I want to just start by saying that um, how singularly, let me try to get to the right place, how singularly appropriate it feels to be um, here at the Katzen Art Center at American University. That's because several years ago, um, before I joined the Arts Endowment, um, I was invited to an event in this very space to celebrate the NEA's 40th anniversary. Today, I feel we're all together uh, for another milestone uh, for the agency, and that I get to talk to you about our long-term research plans based in part on the conceptual work you've just heard Tony describe. This might be a good entree for me to give, talk just a little bit about the history of the research function within the Arts Endowment, very briefly. Uh, the, Arts, the, the Office of Research and Analysis was established in 1975, only 10 years after the NEA came into existence. Known then as the Research Division, it had its first director and an architect named Hal Horowitz, who had come to the agency from the National Science Foundation. Going back through some of the early foundational reports of the NEA's research unit, one starts to see a progression of descriptive statistical reports that set the tone for much of the conversation in the not-for-profit arts sector and in cultural research and policy circles for the years to come. In most of these cases, uh, the research grew out of encounters with large nationally representative statistical data from organizations, households, and individuals about subjects such as revenues generated in the arts, family spending on arts activities, levels of arts attendance, and membership in arts occup artist occupations. Key concepts now taken for granted among arts researchers, such as the purported graying of audiences for certain kinds of arts events, or the high rates of secondary and self-employment among artists, or the notion of the cultural omnivore, all these concepts emerged from NEA research findings. In that sense, you could say that much of our research was highly inductive. Uh, looking at minute observations, in this case through large amounts of data, and generalizing into a theory that may or may not hold true all of the time. By contrast, I would argue that what Tony's model has prepared us to do, I say Tony's model, you're my straw man throughout this, uh, is, is to embark on a new phase of highly deductive research, research that is theory-based and conducive to testing hypotheses about impact through rigorous study designs. I want to be clear that any research program must employ a healthy blend of inductive and deductive reasoning. For a visual arts analogy, um, it's kind of like symbolist painting versus pointillism. Uh, you need both. But it's my belief that for years as a research office, we were perhaps leaning more heavily on the inductive side, reacting to the intricacies and limitations of a particular data set without starting from a hypothesis to guide our analysis and interpretation or even the collection of data. The presentation you're about to see is based on section four of the report, How Art Works, which you should have, and it's out there, which is being distributed today, um, and which is available at arts.gov. In particular, I want to acknowledge the hard work, talents, and creativity of my seven colleagues at the Office of Research and Analysis. Each of them is named in the front of the report. They're really an extraordinary, extraordinary thoughtful, and winning group of people. I'm really proud to work with them. The first half of this short presentation is about a series of assumptions we made going into designing a research agenda for 2012 through 2016, the five-year period covered by the NEA's strategic plan. The strategic plan, which we use as a planning instrument in, and in communications with Congress, the White House Office of Management, and the general public, elevated research to a critical mission of the Arts Endowment, one with the goal of promoting public knowledge and understanding about the contributions of the arts. Right away, you'll note the word contributions in that goal implies a question about the tangible results of the arts, whether through arts involvement or the arts sector itself. And indeed, a measurable outcome of this goal for the NEA is that evidence of the value and impact of the arts is expanded and promoted. I want to take apart those two terms for a moment, value and impact. By value, we mean descriptive information, primarily statistical, that measures or clarifies factors, characteristics, or conditions of the U.S. arts ecosystem, specifically as they, they relate to four components shown here. Arts participants and arts learners, artists and arts workers, arts organizations and industries, and funders and volunteers. 
So you, so you see that far from backing away from collection and reporting of key statistics about the arts, we are giving greater definition to this domain, which will allow us to populate it more effectively with this relevant information. With impact, on the other hand, we refer to quantitative and or qualitative research data that measure or clarify the benefits of the arts to other domains of American life, including health and well-being, cognitive capacity, learning and creativity, community livability, and economic prosperity. Now, how do we operationalize these objectives in our office? We have four broad goals, and this is the last slide of my assumptions prior to embarking on how we managed to do this through Tony's model. So this is, uh, these are the four goals we set for ourselves really even before we, and really midstream through this project with Tony. Um, one was um, over here to identify and cultivate new and existing data sources in the arts. Um, you know, here again is the talk about value and impact and number two. There's also a goal to elevate the public profile of arts related research. And fourth, we also evaluate the administration of NEA programs for impact and effectiveness. Now, these are all things that we do as an office. Um, but we're really, uh, we're here to talk about, in my view, is number two. Uh, the actual studies we, we conduct and how we assess the value and impact of the arts on other domains of American life. So, okay, what we've done here, and this is in the report, is we've taken the map and we've planted on it the research projects currently slated for the next five years. The way we've done this is by um, listing numbers within each relevant node on the map. Each number represents a single research project named in our report as belonging to our five-year agenda. Now, I should explain this is a slightly expanded version of the map that Tony just showed you, but emerging from the core principles of that map, just for the purpose of measurement. The presence of a number in a particular node means that th that research project is concerned primarily with studying the topic area and or its relationship to the nodes directly above it. Uh, think of the map, as Tony was saying, as depicting a cascade effect of the arts flowing downward and then rippling outward here on the left. So for example, project number 24, way down there uh, at, the at the bottom, relates not only to research about the benefit of art to society and communities, it also might explore the relationship between that node and the nodes directly above it in this case, arts participation or arts creation. Likewise, research on the direct and indirect economic benefits of the art will focus not only on those types of outcomes, but also will examine the relationship, those arrows, between this benefit and arts participation and creation, as well as possibly the relationship to other types of outcomes. So let's start by looking at these first two nodes here. Um, arts infrastructure and education and training. We'll leave human impulse to create and express out of it as we see it as really outside the system, as Tony said, acting as the primary motive of arts expression. What do we have going on right now with NEA research with these, within these two nodes, these input variables? I've included here only three of the seven projects on our agenda so far, and again, the agenda is in the report. Since the period covers fiscal years 2012 through 2016, it's natural that some of the projects on the agenda, those accomplished, say, in the last year, have already been completed. The first item is one of them, a research publication we produced at the start of fiscal year 2012, though we, may, though we have plans to update this report with a more in-depth geographical analysis of the American Community Survey data about 11 distinct artist occupations. This clearly covers the infrastructure node a little bit, as does a forthcoming report to be issued within the next few months, how the United States funds the arts, where we look at IRS data, data from the economic census, and from foundations and other federal agencies to report various government source outlays for the arts, report some international comparisons of funding, and estimate foregone tax revenue from individual charitable donations to arts organizations. The third project listed on here, and again, the numbers don't signify chronology or priority necessarily. They're simply a key to individual projects. Uh, the third project would analyze data from the Department of Education's Fast Response Survey of Arts Education, in tandem with data from the Education Department's Common Core of Data, to get a handle of contextual variables for school-based arts education. This project clearly speaks to the node called Education and Training. Going back to the map, we can perceive that, it, that at the heart of the map, as, you, as someone just pointed out, is, I prefer to think of it as the sun, is arts participation with arts creation at its nucleus. Sun doesn't have a nucleus, so I'll have to work on that metaphor. How are, we, how are we attempting to measure these nodes, what we might call the intervening variables, and clarify the relationship to the nodes we just talked about, arts infrastructure and education and training? 
Well, again, I'm going to start with a piece of low-hanging fruit. In 2012, we issued a report called An Average Day in the Arts, State Participation Patterns from the American Time Use Survey, showing how much time on any given day residents in each state for which we have reliable measurements spend on certain arts activities. This is descriptive statistical information. This year, we also conducted a revamped survey of public participation in the arts, the nation's largest cross-sectional survey of arts participation among adults, inclusive of arts creation, and we'll be releasing results of that survey, likely in the spring of 2013, with a full summary report and topic-specific monographs to follow. And this third item here refers to an arts supplement we included in another large national survey, the General Social Survey, in which we inquired for the first time about people's motivations and barriers to arts participation. All of these data will not only tell us much more about the node arts participation, inclusive of arts creation, they will also tell us about how inputs like arts education and arts infrastructure, for example, formal versus informal venues for, or free or paid for events, feed into arts activity. Now we go into measuring the impacts of the arts, specifically what we call first order outcomes. These factors relate to the quality of life of individuals and communities. Here we propose to study three types of benefits to individuals, inclusive of cognitive and emotional benefits, to communities, inclusive of social and civic benefits, and a bit off to one side, and this is one difference between this sort of expanded map and Tony's, uh, we sort of parsed out economic benefits, which is also construed as part of the community benefits in Tony's map, which in, um, we posit are largely social and which include uh, direct and indirect economic benefits. So here are some of the, those projects by way of example. Number 46 refers to a workshop we held just on Friday in partnership with the National Academy of Sciences and the National Institutes of Health, the world's largest funder of biomedical and behavioral research. The goal was to identify gaps and opportunities to support future research on the relationships between the arts and health and well-being outcomes in older adults. A video archive of the workshop, a full report and transcript, and five commission papers will be released in the coming weeks and months. On the opposite side of the lifespan, we're in the very early stages of another impact-oriented research undertaking. Researchers in the arts know that uh, longitudinal data sets are hard to come by, but we have an opportunity with a study that's being developed by NIH in partnership with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the Envi Environmental Protection Agency. This is the National Children's Study, which will examine environmental influences, including cultural, on children's development. We've obtained permission to start working with them to develop questions about music and arts exposure in early childhood, which potentially could be analyzed against uh, many other variables for which data would be captured over time. These are just two items falling under the category of benefit to individuals. As for community benefits, one of our ongoing projects is creating a series of national indicators that can describe what successful outcomes of creative placemaking look like on the ground for the purpose of subsequent evaluation. Many of you know about the creative placemaking grants activity that we have going on through Our Town and other programs. And finally, under economic benefits, we are in discussions with the U.S. Department of Commerce to establish a consistent, durable mechanism for tracking the economic outputs and value added of arts and cultural industries. So now we're in the realm of so-called second-order outcomes of the arts, societal capacities to innovate and to express ideas, and two attendant nodes, outlets for creative expression, and uh, new forms for self-expression. Again, a slightly uh, expansionist version of uh, Tony's map. Um, the report identifies a shortage of high-quality data for these domains, and it suggests that further research be conducted to clearly establish this construct and what key variables would look like. But I want to point out that that's, even though it might take some work to really get us there from a research perspective, these are very intuitive, innate beliefs about what the arts does. I had the privilege, I was with uh, Chairman Landisman earlier today, at a briefing where, um, at a meeting at which um, uh, Senator Udall from New Mexico, Tom Udall, uh, Udall mentioned, happened to mention uh, when we were talking, when he was talking about the value of the arts, he mentioned uh, artists provoke and they really ask questions and they challenge. And that seems to me something that's perhaps captured best by this, this domain where we talk about the right to expression and expressing new ideas that may not always sit comfortably with the status quo. Um, so we've just established this is a very difficult thing to measure. Still, never one to shirk a challenge. Our team has sallied forth in the hope of providing clarity to these concepts through empirical data. First, earlier this year, we held a symposium that is also available virtually at arts.gov in conjunction with the Brookings Institution on new ideas about how the arts might be explored in light of economic growth theory. 
notably the so-called new growth or endogenous growth theory popularized by Paul Romer. We produced nearly a dozen papers from the event, which will be published next year. We also worked with our colleagues uh, at the U.S. Department of Agriculture to place an item about arts and culture on a survey that it will be fielding in rural communities to ask about business characteristics, including decisions to locate. And finally, though this may lie further ahead, based in part on the Brookings work, we want to explore further the connection between design and utility patents on product innovation. Well, that's the map, and I'm sticking to it, for now. Um, <laughs> Let me remind you that a lot of the items you'll see in the detailed research agenda and the report are mutable. Uh, we have to be adaptive and flexible, as Tony said, and responsive to emerging opportunities, as well as to different directions in which our queries may take us. But underlying all of these projects are these three cross-cutting initiatives I'd like to point out, which don't relate to any particular note on the map. We now find ourselves in the second year of our grants program dedicated to research on the value and impact of the arts, research art works. The 11 projects we've funded so far, or sorry, 14 projects we've funded so far, I believe, uh, yes, 14, are, are listed in the back of the report, and I'm proud of all of them. The application uh, period is open for the next year of funding. Uh, the deadline for the program is November 6th. Please go to our website if you want more information. I think that'll be my only plug. We also have underway plans to house an online data repository, merging uh, public and, where possible, administrative and commercial data sets that will prove of value to the arts research community, complete with user's guides, data dictionaries, search functions, visualizations, and basic analytical tools. And finally, we have hopes for establishing a virtual research network to connect people working in this sector across disciplines, areas of expertise, and perhaps even across continents to share working papers and to pursue solutions to common problems. Whew. That's quite a roster of projects, I hope you'll agree. And bear in mind, that's a partial list. What gives me confidence, however, is that we now have an organizational frame by which to evaluate our progress in these areas and to make mid-course corrections where necessary. What gives me further confidence is our role within the federal government. Because we operate within a small agency, one that I have to say is quite appealingly agile to the eyes of other bigger bureaucracies, we have access to large tracts of data and technical resources which, by extension, are now available or will be available to the arts research community at large. Um, so uh, I just wanted to kind of point out that um, you know, some of the things we've done as an agency have really opened doors for our own research and we hope certainly for the field in general, uh, having relationships with the Department of Health and Human Services. We have an interagency task force in the arts and human development consisting of something like 14 federal agencies uh, that are committed to understanding how the arts relate to health and well-being and educational outcomes throughout the lifespan. Uh, we also belong to, uh, we, we're a course sponsor of the Committee on National Statistics, the National Academies, which gives us uh, room to kind of not only attend, but actively participate in discussions about definitional issues and uh, data collections uh, pertaining to the, the public at large. Um, and finally, we have some just kind of one-off, kind of, in some cases, systematic relationships with uh, some federal agencies shown here, U.S. Census Bureau, through which we've done our own surveys, uh, the Bureau of Economic Analysis, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, uh, people of the Department of Education's National Center for Education Statistics, as well as some units within, for example, HUD and USDA Agriculture, um, and I might mention again IMLS, which has been a great research partner. Um, I, I showed all this to remind you that, of course, it's not, what gives me some hope is we're not doing this alone, and we have these allies. Um, another plus on our side is, our, is the eager collaboration and goodwill of so many organizations and researchers like those of you in, the room, in this room. We seem to have lit on a moment in time when there's a growing hunger for this kind of information and how we use it to make decisions. I want to close by saying that I think a dark horse of that report is um, how art works is an online appendix that's available as of today on our website listing some of the most promising resources, either reports or data sets, to advance us further down the road. I want to thank um, Andrew and Sherburn and um, also, uh, of course, uh, Tony, and, 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 and I particularly want to single out, actually, the leadership at the NEA, uh, Chairman Landisman and Joan. And I wanted to kind of end with a couplet, she doesn't know about this, to, for Joan, because I think one of the things you see about the system map is the arts are right in the center. So I thought of Joan and I thought about the system map, and uh, there's a, line, a couple lines by Robert Frost. Uh, we all, we dance around in a ring and suppose, but the secret sits in the middle and knows. <laughs> Thank you. That's kissing up to your boss. <laughs> I'm just kidding.
you have any questions? Thank you. Uh, we do have time for some questions or comments. Uh, I know there's research in the room, and I know one of the taglines of American University is wonk, and I'm, I'm wonking out right now, because this is exciting stuff. Isn't it great? Research, data. Anybody have questions for Sunil or comments about this new path of research for the National Endowment for the Arts? I see a gentleman, he's either walking to the mic or he's just, I've upset him terribly. Well, Sunil, I'm really interested in looking through this more closely and, and looking at the, um, the array of um, projects that you've put there. I wonder if there are any projects that you and your team have been thinking about in, the, in a blue sky way that you'd like to do eventually that you couldn't find some place on the map to put it? Is there some project that really would be interesting and worthwhile but doesn't fit somewhere in this system? That's a great question. Well, what gave me some wiggle room, I think, and I think it really helps make the map sturdier because you don't want to pursue something for which, in which you're not invested, obviously. And so we, we really troubleshooted it. But I think the thing that gave me confidence was that, so, so before, I think the data collection aspect, so much of our work is just doing fundamental data collection and gathering in data that we can then make publicly available for other researchers. And so is, is it true that those things, that activity really sits on one of those nodes? I couldn't really see it sitting on any particular node, which is why I had the three cross-cutting uh, initiatives, because I think there are some things that we need to do to sustain the field, help sustain the field, and inspire, hopefully, other researchers through work. So I think that's something which, so your short answer is no, there wasn't anything that I, we could find, although, as, as I think Rocco said, if something does show up, uh, let us know, and we'll, we'll really, and we already are looking at it and seriously trying to take it apart and see if, if it's durable, and that's, that's the real test of it. Yes. Hi, um, I'm in the arts management program here in my second year, and part of the process is doing a capstone project. And one of the things that I'm realizing in this field that is still developing, and with such a model that's still developing, it, but yet refining as it goes, um, one of the things that is difficult, yet so interesting, is that I'm finding kind of multiple terms meaning pretty much the same thing, or um, how do you, like for example, participation, creation, and engagement, it, are they the same thing? How do you deal with that situation? Do you use them synonymously? And how does the model handle that? So what I think it does, I, I, I started off by talking deliberately about kind of inductive versus deductive, because I think we're at a point when we we have a map now, we have a theory, it, we have many theories, but we have a, kind of a, a framework for the map, for, I mean, for the theories. And it requires us now to drill deeper and actually define things much more clearly and systematically and consistently. And I think we've done that to good measure, partly through this report, which actually does break down each, what is participation in this map? What does it mean? And that was something that they didn't, you know, all respect to Tony, he and his team didn't just go off and jot that down. It was like a really well-argued proposition. Um, so that, in turn, is going to guide, I think, the way we start looking at data collections and the way we classify and categorize the data that we bring in. So arts participation is a central example because we do a series of surveys on arts participation, and we've been challenged over the years to keep up with that construct. And now we're, in a way, being brought back to essentials. What is arts participation in an abstract sense, and how can we then look at data and, and populate that, that theory? Thank you. Oh, sorry. Yes, Joan. Hi. I'm Joan, Joan Jeffrey from the Research Center for Arts and Culture. I'm also a scholar in residence this year at AU. Um, some of us have been around for a very long time in the research community, and I just wanted to uh, publicly say how extraordinary the work of the National Endowment for the Arts under Rocco, Joan, and Sunil has been in this area. This is really like a rocket ship taking off. I mean, I think for many, many years there was a lot of kind of plotting, not so interesting, but regular research. And I think now the research community is totally enlivened, uh, whether you agree or don't agree on specifics of this report. And I would also kind of like to make a plea for continuing to involve graduate students in the work that you're doing, because they're the future of research. But mostly, I just wanted to commend you all on you. what a great job you've done. Thank you, John. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Felipe Huitrago. I'm a student in SAIS, uh, but I'm also a Latin American expert in cultural industries. And I find that 
you have presented a series of theoretical and, and practical frameworks, but also the intention of going deep on data collection and, and organizing it. And this has been a, a very uh, intense debate around the world, and especially in Latin America. And I want to know if you are interested or is part of the process to consult or to be part of that debate, because usually what the Americans do is like separate the leg from the rest. And I, I find a lot of commonality that can be really discussed and can enrich both sides. So I just want to make sure I understood the question. Are you talking about debates about this map or debates no, generally? Maybe. I couldn't hear a question. It's both. At about the map, how you, how you conceptualize the thing, because, because there are many other uh, approaches and that can complement right. or can enrich the, the, the whole approach, but also how you gather the data, how you deal with the data, how you solve the problems of, 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 the, of the aggregation and the aggregation of, of the data that the census and everything have, because it's, it's been a part of, of a common problem uh, across, I mean, the UK, in Colombia, in Argentina, in Brazil, and, and there's some expertise there, but also uh, I'm pretty sure there's some expertise here, but there's very little connection, and I'm pretty sure both sides can actually benefit from a, a wider dialogue. Yeah, and that's what I was hoping to get at with that virtual research network idea, um, because we really feel that in, in increasingly that we, we are in some places, some cases we're sometimes a step behind or in some cases even a step ahead. What we hear, what we know of research being done in other countries, uh, particularly around those relations between well-being and the arts, I would argue. And also, uh, just as you say, the concept of arts participation and understanding it in its totality. Um, we really do benefit much more from that international dialogue and, and debates, frankly. So. Um, we're trying to do that through our own ways, like we, we have some contacts in the UK to start with. It's sort of, again, low-hanging fruit in the sense that it's, you know, we can speak the same language directly. But we also are looking increasingly to other places in South America, Australia, of course, another English-speaking language, uh, English-speaking country. But we're open to these debates. And I think what Joan was saying earlier, Joan Jeffrey, yeah. um, while it was a compliment, it also, I mean, it, we definitely have to um, invest more heavily in, in looking outside our borders and understanding these other countries. Uh, way of operating so we can take back some really good lessons for ourselves. And, and researchers are already doing that across the country. Yeah. We just have to do it as well. Okay, thank you. Good, good. good. Okay. <laughs> Hi. Looking at your studies that you're choosing to do, and I know this is only a partial list, but I noticed that there's a lot more studies concentrated on the benefit of arts to individuals versus society and communities. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that decision? Yeah, and it's sort of a de facto. So, so what we did, I should be very clear, is we, we used the map to organize our existing research and our planned research. We still have a roster. We could still generate more products, and we still will over the next four to five years. Um, so, so, but the individual, I would argue that many of the projects for which we currently have the best data or the best prospects are those in which are seeking to study individuals over time in terms of cognitive, emotional types of benefits. Um, you know, and in fact, we have some in there about physiological benefits that we're, we're also monitoring or taking part in. Um, but community is something, community in both that and the economic impact stuff, I think those are two of the biggest challenges for us as an agency and maybe for the arts research community as a whole. Because it's much harder, I think, to, um, to aggregate in ways, to, to really operationalize and come up with definitions that are compatible when talking about community, when talking about what parts of the economic growth do we care about, you know, what, what types of economic growth. Um, and so, so those are things we're still working on, but I think the projects we've chosen, I, I hope we've chosen wisely, and uh, those are things we want to definitely hammer home. Anything else? Okay. All right. Thanks, well, thanks to Neil and Tony one more time. Thank you.